to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask it this way. What if we started paying people to come to church? What would it be like if every time you came in, you got a thousand bucks? Would our numbers go up? Maybe. Probably. After all, people who cannot stand the glorious Christ are still well enamored with some of the things he could give us. People who don't really like church love what the church might provide. So, as embarrassing as it is, I just want to bless you guys. Under your pew, you will find a check for $1,000. <laughs> it's made out of rubber. Don't, cal- don't, don't check. cash it. It will bounce. This morning, we begin to look into what Jesus says Jesus is. And let's be very clear about our intentions. I want you, after the next seven weeks, to love Jesus more than you do now. Not because of what he gives you or what you hope to attain apart from the obvious eternal life and spiritual things but because of what he is. Because all that he is, is all that we need. And so over the next few weeks, we'll talk about Jesus as the bread of life. That's today. Jesus as the light of the world. Jesus as the door of the sheep. Jesus as the good shepherd. Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus as the true vine. Make no mistake, my friends, the draw this morning of Calvary Bible Church is Jesus. That's what we want to foster. That's the attitude we want to encourage. All that he is, is all that we need. Why? Well, our preaching theme this year has been Christ and him crucified. We need to focus on Christ and him crucified. But I also want to keep pointing you to Jesus. I I want you to see his glory. I want you to taste his richness. And it may be true that there's no better way to learn about Jesus than to examine what he actually said about himself. I think there's a real danger in loving Jesus or even loving Christianity because we think it's a guarantee to a better life. It's as if we look up to the heavens and say, God, if you give me comfort, God, if you give me material things, God, if you give me bread, I'll follow you. As if he's a friend that has a swimming pool, so we tolerate him for the things he might give us. Now, full disclosure, before I pray and we get to the text, there is no way I can preach through the entirety of John 6 in one sermon. So we are going to blast through certain parts, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Dom, could you not have taken six months on this one chapter? I could have, but I won't. See, none of you are thinking that. I can tell. Let's get to the Lord and get to the text. Dear Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the bread of heaven. And while he stood in the midst of your people, they clamored for regular bread. Instead of their souls being fed by the truth of your gospel, they longed to have their bellies filled with the food of this world. Lord, they showed your son the dishonor of following him only because of what he might give to them. And Lord, I fear that we are all like that to some extent. And so, Lord, I don't want to make another step in that direction. 
All that you are, Lord Jesus, is all that we need. And our cup overflows. If there is someone here this morning, someone here who, who wonders what the draw is, wonders what the big deal is. Would you grant them life? Would you grant them eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to respond? Fill not only their bellies, but their souls. We ask this to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's Start at the end. Would you look at verse 66? This is John 666, and this is the darkest, darkest verse in the whole chapter. I put it on the screen because I wanted you to see it. Okay? John 666 says this. Are you ready, beloved? It says this. As a result of this, we're going to see what the this is. As a result of this, Many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Let's stop right there. That's what we're leading up to. I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, the word disciples. This passage will not tell us why the critical, cold, unbelieving world would not listen to Jesus. This passage will tell us why the people who were following him stopped sad and notice this and they were not walking with him anymore which means what they were before there is something in our text that sent the professing believing masses packing and it was this are you ready for what the, this is Jesus will refuse to give them bread after he shows that he can, after he shows that he's willing, when they made an idol out of what he provided, he refused to keep providing it, and they would not have him anymore. He was their friend when he had a swimming pool. The second he drained the pool, they left. What about you? Do you barter with Christ? Do you say, you give me health, I'll give you worship? Do you say, you give me money, I'll give you worship? Do you say, you give me pizza, and I'll give you worship? Let's look then at the miracle. Now again, I'm going to go pretty quick here, so let's follow along together in the text. In verse 1 of John chapter 6, beloved, we find this. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him. I want you to see this. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. That's where we start. They saw that Jesus could do the miraculous, that he did do the miraculous, that he delighted to do the miraculous, and they were in. They saw sick people healed, blind people received their sight. They saw the glorious things of Christ, and they were in. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We'll see that later in verse 29, where it says, no, not in 29, in a different verse, verse 30. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? Answer is, he already did. In verse Three, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples, and then, beloved, we begin to see the sanctified setup. I love this. In verse 5, therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that th these may eat? Now, this, he was saying to test him. For he himself knew what he was intending to do. It's as if Jesus said this to, to Philip. How much should we pay the people to stay? He was testing them. He wanted to see what Philip would say. And here's what Philip said. It's beautiful. It's exactly what we would say. He says this. 
Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? And then this was to test him in verse 7. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. For everyone to receive a little. Please, beloved, stop there. Notice what Philip said. If we spend all our money to provide pizza for the masses, it's too expensive and it would never be enough. They need bread that is enough. They need bread that is sufficient, and we don't have enough money for that. And then notice what happens later. Verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, that Simon Peter's brother, said to him, here's a little kid who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Can we acknowledge something? It's kind of a stupid thing to say isn't it? Five barley loaves and two fish wouldn't feed this amount of people, let alone 5,000 people. Why bring it up? Well, here's why. He's asking this, is what we consider insufficient, sufficient? Can we get it done with this? Verse 10, Jesus said, yep. He said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000, which if you count my imaginary friends, that's how many people we have in this room right now. <laughs> Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish, as look at this, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up, filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over from those who had eaten. Did you see that? They had more leftovers than they had food when they started. That's the miracle. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, verse 14, they said, this is truly the prophet who's come into the world. Now, how would the people respond to not only seeing him heal the sick, but to see that he could feed them to their bellies content whenever they wanted to? Well, they wanted to make him king. They wanted him on their throne. If you can feed us and if you can heal us, we'll follow you. And so far, we're thinking so good, right? Wrong. Verse 15. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force and make him king, stood up and said, finally, you recognize me as the Messiah. No, he left. He left. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. That's the miracle. Mo leads us then to the move. This baffles us. Because we think Jesus is like us. We think Jesus wants the room to be full regardless of their attitude. But Jesus isn't like us. He knows something just switched in their mind. He knows that what he had provided freely, they will now demand of him. Bread. So notice this in verse 16. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into the boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It already had become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And the, the winds and the waves and the storm, we're basically going to skip this part. Again, I'm moving quickly, but we'll get back to this sometime. Verse 22. The next day the crowd stood on the other side of the sea and saw there were no other small boats there except for one. And Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. So other boats came. Other boats came. Verse 23, there came other small boats from Tiberias near the place where they ate the bread of the Lord. 
You see, the thing is, if you start handing out free food, people assemble. I mean, don't shout out an amen here. But how many of you have ever had this process in your brain? Oh, man, you got that thing at church tonight? I don't want to do that. Oh, pizza? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, I'm there. Sinners. I confess. It helps sometimes. Verse 24, so when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples, they themselves got in the small boats. They went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, let's stop there in verse 24. They're seeking Jesus. And we're tempted in the story here to say, hey, that, that's good. Whatever it takes. But you have to understand, Jesus is not thinking that way. If he thought that way, he would have stayed there. No, he's leaving because they want him to be their king. That's not a good thing in this context. Because they want him to be their king so he will heal them, so he will feed them, not because they believe him genuinely to be their Lord, their master, the Messiah. So notice what we find here. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And verse 26, beloved, 26 tells us what they really cared about. They didn't care about the miracle. They didn't care about their Messiah. They they cared about the manna, the bread. In verse 26, look at this, they demand a sign. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs. That's a good thing. You seek me because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You see what Jesus is saying? You're bartering with me. You're willing to make me king if I provide you with pizza. I mean, let's be honest. Pizza's just bread with sauce and cheese. We're not that much different than these people. They probably didn't have pizza. He said, You're not following me because you saw the signs. You're following me because your bellies are full. And it was free. It's not a good thing. Or at least not the best thing. Verse 27. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. In verse 28, they said to him, What then shall we do so that we may work the works of God? What a great question, if they meant it. But they didn't. We know that because of how Jesus responds. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Unbelieving friends, make no mistake. The only work, quote unquote, he requires at your hand is to believe in the one that the Father has sent. Receive the gospel, that's it. Easy? Well, look. So they said to him, verse 30, I love this. Uh, What then do you do for a sign so that we may uh, see and believe you? Let me translate that from a literal Greek to English. Hey, Jesus, it's lunchtime. Got any bread? Or it's a very loose translation. (laughs) He's like, all right, so what are you you gonna give me? I'll believe in you. What? what?" (laughs) Where's the give? Where's the take here? Are we talking rye? Are we talking marble rye? What kind of bread are you bringing? We know that they mean this. It's not my interpretation. It's absolute fact because verse thirty-one says this: Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. 
You get that? Jesus said, the work of God is to believe in me, and they say, okay, let's discuss this over a couple of loaves, a couple of slices of pizza. By the way, remember, God the Father rained bread for the people of Israel. They're saying, if you're the Messiah, where's our bread? If you're our friend, where's the pool? And notice, verse 32, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Now, you would think at this point they would get it. It's obvious to us. They still didn't get it. Why? Verse 34. Then they said, Lord, always give us this bread. And it sounds great, doesn't it? You're like, wow, this is awesome. They want what Jesus provides. No. They want some of what Jesus provides. Because Jesus is about to double down now. <laughs> and you would think, at this point, just to keep numbers up, he would start passing out bread. Like, or whatever it takes to fill the room. Let's, let's just fill the room. We don't want, we don't want numbers to go down. Let's, let's, let's give them some pita bread or something just to keep them happy. He doesn't. Verse 35 tells us this. The determination of the Savior is this. You will get me or nothing. Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And then he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. Now, these verses are crying out to be explained, but we really don't have time this morning. We'll come back to them some other time. Verse 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him has eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. What is he saying, friends? He's saying this, God gave manna to Israel. I am the manna that God gives to you. Speaking of himself, obviously he says, Jesus says of himself, I am the bread that God provides for you. Not simply I am the means by which you will get bread. He says, I am the bread. Are you hungry? And they go, no. Because we want pizza instead of Jesus. Now, by the way, I love pizza. I don't want any emails tomorrow, right, saying, Dom, why are you so anti-pizza? I'm very pro-pizza. But Jesus is better than pizza, right? Because you eat pizza, and if you're anything like me, you swallow the first piece. One or two bites, like a crazy dog. The second piece, you realize people are watching you, so you eat it a little slower. And then you say, wow, that was great. You wait till no one's looking, and you grab two more slices out of the fridge. You're always hungry for more. With Jesus, you're never hungry for more. If you have Jesus, you're satisfied. If you have Jesus, the hunger not only dies, the hunger is satisfied. All that he is is all we need. We need food. He gives it to us but not in the way they were clamoring for it. Which leads then to his primary message in our text, verse 41. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him. <laughs> Why? Because he said this, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. See, they were fine when Jesus was giving them food. When Jesus said, I am the food, they, they didn't like it. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? 
And Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. He's saying, your hunger for bread is natural. Your hunger for Christ is supernatural. And I will raise him up on the last day, verse 45. It's written in the prophets, you will all, they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has learned from the Father comes to me. Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. 48, I am the bread of life. What is he saying? See, it becomes clear to us now. What he is saying is, I am what you need. I am what the Father provided. I am the answer to the deepest hunger of your souls. It's me, not food. The promise of God is simply that They will learn directly from him. And the provision of God is Jesus. The answer to all of our deepest, most important needs. If we love Jesus in the hopes that he will give us external, physical things, we dishonor him. I want to read to you a quote from one of my favorite dead preachers, A.W. Tozer. In his book, Man, the Dwelling Place of God, it's an absolute classic. Go and buy it. If you have a couple of bucks, it's worth it. It says this, God being who he is must always be sought for himself and never as a means towards something else. Whoever seeks other objects and not God is on his own. He may obtain those objects if he's able, but he will never have God. God is never found accidentally. You shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Shameless plug, our preaching theme for 2023 is he will let you find him. Tozer goes on to say this, whoever seeks God as a means toward desired ends will not find God. The mighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, will not be one of many treasures, not even the chief of all treasures. He will be all or he will be nothing. God will not be used. His mercy and grace are infinite and his patient understanding is beyond measure. But he will not aid men in their selfish striving after personal gain. Wow, I wish I could talk like that. The provision of God is Jesus, who is our provision and must be what we're seeking. That's the message. And then we get from there to the menu. Notice in verse 51, it says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread of which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh, my my body. Then the Jews began to argue with one another. Surprise! (laughs) Saying, how can this guy give us his flesh to eat? Now here is where Jesus could step in and say, no, 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 no. You got me wrong here. You got me wrong here. Let me explain it better. Or no, 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 here's a slice of bread. Listen to me now. He doesn't. Verse 53. He says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. You notice this. He doubles down on the part of the message that's offending them, that's confusing them. Why? Make no mistake. Jesus does not suggest that he be our everything. He demands that he be our everything. And that's why the people started leaving. He doubles down on the part that they don't get. Verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. 
As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. The confusion was they kept taking him literally. And yet he be- continues to challenge them. As if he were saying, all that I am is all that you need. I could feed you and you would die eventually. Or I can be your Messiah, Jesus says, and you'll never die. If you're anything like me, sometimes you go out to eat and you, you fill up and you, you, you kind of go, oh man, I'm stuffed. I went a little too far. And then you're driving home, and you're like, ice cream, right? <laughs> right? We're insatiable. Jesus says our desire for the earthly things will never go away until the earth changes and we do. But he says, if you believe in him, you'll never be hungry again. It truly satisfies. We don't come to Christ and then say, what else? What more? We come to Christ and say, I'm full. He is the bread of life. It's awesome. It leads us then to their tragic mistake. Verse 59. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Somewhere along the way, they they ended up in a synagogue. He's preaching there, and therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, Jesus, you are so easy to understand. And we get it. You were speaking metaphorically. No. They go, Jesus, this is hard. It's hard because you are speaking metaphorically and you're doubling down on the hardest part. Verse 61, but Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Wow. Why not say, you guys, the disciples, are just a little slow, a little confused. No, what he's challenging them with, my friends, is this. When Jesus speaks, even when he says hard things, like no one can come to the Father unless he's drawn to him, or I am the bread of life and my flesh is food and drink. Even when he says hard things, especially when he says hard things, is he the Christ? If he is, we bow at his feet, not critique his teaching methods. Verse 62, what then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before, which incidentally all of them but Judas would. How are you going to deal with that? Man, I wish I could have been there. I guarantee you this. As he is ascending into heaven, none of his disciples said, got any bread? Anybody got any pizza? No. Jesus is saying this. This isn't the hardest thing to receive. You'll see more difficult things. Notice how he, he, he says in verse 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. That's just a reminder. Belief is supernatural. Belief is not natural. It is supernatural. The Spirit does it. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Now, this is important to remember, too, that just because a crowd is assembled even to listen to Jesus doesn't mean they're believers. That's why I don't want you to be offended if I address any unbelievers who may be in the room. I don't assume we're all believers. Jesus says, 
There are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who believed, who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. And he, he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him from the Father. Jesus says, the reason why some of you keep thinking I'm talking about pizza instead of the provision of a Savior is because you don't believe. You don't have eyes to see yet. You don't have ears to hear yet. And that was a breaking point. And then people started to leave. I want you to see how this all ends. John 6, 67 to 68 says this. Now, I want to remind you of 666 here. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. And this is 67 becomes this, the saddest verse in the passage. Notice what it says. So Jesus said to the 12, stop. People are leaving in mass. They're leaving because the bread isn't being provided anymore. They're leaving because Jesus' teachings are hard to understand. And he turns to his 12 and he says this. You don't want to go away also, do you? What's he saying? He's saying, I know, Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying, I know I'm not enough for them. Am I enough for you? And then Peter, who gets a bad rap sometimes because he's impulsive and talks a lot. He's a loud mouth. I see me in Peter so much. Before we get to the second verse here, a few years ago, it's probably about 10 years ago now, a lady came up to me after church. This was in a previous church. And she came up to me and she said, Dom, I just want to thank you. And I go, for what? And she says, I've been to almost every other church in our little town, and you do something that nobody else does. And I go, it's the jokes, aren't it? No, I didn't say it. Um, I go, well, what? What do I do that nobody else around seems to be doing? And she says, you open the Bible, and you tell us what it says. It's a true story. And my jaw dropped. I was obviously very blessed, but here's how I reacted. I said, what else would I do? I'm not that clever. Notice how Peter responds. Jesus says, are you going away too? Are you leaving? Am I insufficient for you? And Peter says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. You see what he's saying? Who needs food when you give us the Bible, the gospel, right? And the disciples, many of the disciples left because they were no longer being fed literally. Peter's refusing to move because he has finally been fed spiritually. Peter becomes our hero here. He says what we hope we would say, that we long to say. So how can I bring all this to a conclusion? First of all, Jesus is the one who came down from heaven to be our sustenance. Secondly, Jesus is the one on whom we must metaphorically feast upon in order to never be hungry again. But thirdly, primarily, Jesus is not to be sought as simply a means to an end. He must be celebrated not just for what we hope to get from him, but for what he is. And all he is, is all we need. 
When the going gets tough, Jesus is enough. Right? I feel it's necessary for me to comment on how this principle flies in the face of much of modern evangelicalism. It just seems like churches are intent on adding whatever they can to Jesus just to get people to pay attention. And I know that there's value in that, especially in evangelism, but in discipleship, Jesus is all we need. So I feel it's necessary to challenge you on this. One more quote from A.W. Tozer. Being who he is, God is to be loved for his own sake. He is the reason for our loving him, just as he is the reason for his loving us and for every other act he has performed, is performing and will perform world without end. God's primary reason for everything is his own good pleasure. The search for secondary reasons is gratuitous and mostly futile. It affords occupation for theologians to add pages to books on doctrine. But that it ever turns up anything, any true explanations, is doubtful. God wills that we should love him for himself alone with no hidden reasons, trusting him to be to us all our natures require. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Dear Heavenly Father, we have, in so many ways, we have dishonored your provision. In so many ways, we have minimized the greatness of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Lord, if there's someone here today for whom now is the time when their eyes are being opened, when their heart is being opened, when they can see and hear, would you please whisper into their souls that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved? Would you please stir within them and draw them so that they would cry out to you and say, Father, I know I'm sinful and I know that you're sinless. I know that Jesus is the bread to fill my hunger. Would you receive me? Would you remind them that your Bible says that to them who received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And that your Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you move them so that they would Respond by saying, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. And would you fill and satisfy and satiate their hunger for life? For those of us who already know you, would you forgive us for our distracting appetite? We are prone to wander, Lord. We feel it. Would you remind us that all that you are is all that we need to the praise of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.